Good morning or good afternoon, FX Street, depending upon where you are around the globe. Um, it's, uh, oh, let me see here. Uh, are we having a problem with the audio? Uh, okay, good. Can everybody hear me all right? Excellent. All right, can everybody see what's going on here? We've got a, uh, a uh, chart, a five-minute chart of uh, pound USD on the uh, on the uh, screen here. Can everyone see that? All right. <clears throat> Basically, uh, I think we're just in time for my uh, normal counter trend trade of the morning. Uh, by the time we come on at uh, 10 a.m., all right. Usually, we've had some uh, pretty big action, and at that point in time, a lot of the things that we're looking to do are, are typically counter trend in nature. Why? Well, you can see these tremendous moves that have already occurred. Uh, we know about what's happened with the uh, euro already so far this morning. Okay, but what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at pound, and I see that uh, it looks like it's settling, and it's putting in a little bit of a base here. All right, we've got, uh, obviously, we're in uh, a bit of a downtrend here on the five-minute chart. just want to flip it over to 30-minute chart. We'll take a look, and you can see that we're coming up around support here, right around that 163.50 area. So while, uh, you know, this has been a pretty big and hefty move down, and it's actually moved down rather quickly um, on uh, basically on Trichet's comments, uh, which were happening, All right, it looks like we may be putting in a little bit of a base here and that perhaps there's going to be a buy maybe ahead of 163.50. All right, I mean, I'm looking at this little teeny candle right here and that shows me eh, it's a little bit of a hammer, um, but not a great one. Um, but at this point, uh, I'm just kind of keeping an eye on this to see uh, where it's going and potentially if, uh, if this is a trade that we want to make. I mean, this could be a nice uh, potential uh, short here. Okay, if it looks like we put in, uh, say, a bear flag here or a bear pennant or something like that. So I'm not inclined to hop in yet. I don't think the candle uh, candles have been great reversal candles just yet. Okay, so it just looks like maybe we've got a little bit of a pause here going on while the market sort of uh, decides if we've gone too far too fast. So that's the idea behind <clears throat> excuse me, trading made simple is that we're just looking at uh, areas of support and resistance. We're using candle action. Okay, to, to potentially find some uh, low-risk trading opportunities. All right, and you can see here uh, earlier uh, on Trichet's comments, we had uh, uh, dollar strengthening, we had pound weakening. We can just look at the euro as well, and I'm sure you've seen this already this morning. Okay, euro fell right out of bed just as Trichet was talking. Now, I think the markets were expecting that um, he was going to be a little bit more hawkish and try and put a little bit more pressure on uh, EU policymakers to get a handle on the uh, Greek debt crisis and, uh, as a result, the entire Euro debt crisis, All right? But he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't that forceful about it. So, you know, the market's thinking, okay, well, you know what? Maybe, uh, maybe this uh, rate hike coming next month that everyone's been sort of anticipating isn't such a done deal. So, those are the kind of things that, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, we're looking at as we go through. Um, I'm going to answer your questions as we go through. Um, Philip's asking here if I've tried harmonics to catch counter trend trades. Um, you know, I've looked at it in the past, Philip. Um, but to be honest with you, um, it's like any other indicator. You know, they've got their pluses, they've got their minuses. There's different ways you can use them. To be honest, I'd prefer to just look at straight price action, what the candles are doing. Um, it's just a much simpler, a cleaner way to do it. Um, people who've been on this webinar before know here are my charts. I've got just the standard uh, 22 Bollinger Band and a 553 stochastic setting, okay, which just shows me a little bit of overbought, oversold conditions. I'm going to flip back to the pound here real quick, see what's happening. It looks like we're pushing just a little bit higher here, up to uh, 163.72. And we've got the uh, we've got support here, uh, about 58, just ahead of 50. Okay, that could be a, uh, uh, you know, we could be setting up for a buy here soon. But I may want to wait and see what happens at the uh, uh, middle band here, which is the 20-period moving average, as well as uh, that level of 163.75, which looks like it could be a little bit minor support. So I'm not inclined to jump this just yet, but there uh, there could be a, a potential trade in there. So anyway, getting back to um, uh, Trichet, the Eurozone, uh, this kind of thing. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting, though, to see you know, sort of how the market's been reacting with the difference between... Uh, you know, what they've been doing as far as ECB and how they've been handling uh, their rate policy meetings and, you know, the contrast here uh, with the U.S. Fed. And if you think about it, um, you know, people are saying, God, are, are they nuts at the ECB? You know, well, how could they possibly raise rates with what's going on in Greece, Portugal, and Ireland and all these places? And it's the kind of thing where, you know, the ECB is out in front of this and they're saying, listen, you know, there's obviously a problem here. This needs to be fixed. We're going to do what we have to do to combat inflation and to have correct monetary policy. Now it's up to government officials to fix the problems that are structural, that ail us. 
All right, and you can tell that's a stark contrast to what's going on here in the U.S., all right? Politicians here in the U.S. haven't done anything about fiscal policy, nor have they done anything to fix the structural pro uh, problems. But what happens? All right, Bernanke is, uh, we're going to end up calling this guy down the road the great enabler. Okay, why? Well, he's saying, well, you know, gee, you just can't get your act together, but that's okay. I'll give you some more time. Here's some more quantitative easing to the market. You know, that'll keep everybody happy for a while. But there's really no pressure on politicians to act. Okay, because we've got everything going on from a monetary policy perspective and nothing being done from a fiscal policy perspective. All right, so we've obviously, uh, you know, seen some dollar weakness. All right, we've had dollar strength as of late. We've had dollar weakness. Euro's up, euro's down. Basically, what we're saying is that there's a lot of volatility at this level. All right, we're not certain exactly what's going to happen at the end of QE2. All right, we know that the data's been coming in weaker. All right, has that really been driving money to the dollar for the safe haven aspects of it? Not exactly, all right? I think we've seen things like uh, gold come back up near their highs, and also the Swiss franc's been moving, okay? So there's a lot of different uh, things going on in the market today that, um, you know, affect uh, these different currencies and how they're moving. So just looking here at this, uh, this pound, hmm, it's getting tempting right here, I got to tell you. Uh, let's see if there's anything else happening that looks a little bit better. Euro moving back and... Basically, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on this uh, middle Bollinger Band here, this 20-period moving average. All right, that's going to serve as a little bit of minor support. Okay, we could do something like uh, run a Fibonacci, even on as, as, as low as a five-minute chart, okay? Or we could take a look at pivot points just to see if there's anything out there as far as these levels go. But I just want to kind of keep an eye on the action and see what's happening. Um, so it looks like, uh, you know, we've got uh, potentially these uh, uh, oil inventory numbers coming up in a little while, and that could be um, a factor. Uh, with what goes on with the uh, euro. Okay? Euro tends to have a uh, positive correlation to oil, oil, excuse me, a little bit, all right, because it's got a uh, uh, an inverse uh, correlation to the U.S. dollar. So, you know, these are the kind of things that we're looking at when we talk about trading made simple. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to backtrack a little bit here. I want to drop down a time frame or two and see what the uh, what the charts look like. All right, and you can see here that we had on the euro, we had this candle close entirely outside of the band, just below 145. All right, this is a 30 minute chart. Okay, that's usually a pretty decent reversal type candle. You can see the lows here about 144.76. All right, if I were into this for a little bit more of a longer term trade, I would potentially hop on this puppy right here. Um, let's go back and we'll look at this on a two hour chart. All right, but you can see it looks like the action is clearly down, although we've got a little bit of a hammer. That happened here, okay? And you can see that there's uh, some visible support at 145, all right? 145, let me just uh, get out a little line here for us. All right, you can see right here with this line that, um, you know, 145 had acted as resistance prior to, and you can see right here on the 3rd of June, boom, just that big explosion through there. All right, we've come back down, and now potentially this former resistance is going to act as support. All right, so that's kind of, uh, you know, some of the things that we're looking at here. Uh, let me see. Uh, 44.30 is visual longer-term charts like a four-hour. Yeah, genius. Um, the four-hour charts are nice. I like them, but I typically trade on a much uh, faster time frame, as a lot of you know. So most of the stuff I do is intraday trading. Um, sometimes it involves scalping, depending upon uh, what the market's doing. Other times, it's, uh, you know, we're looking for these intraday swing trades where we can, uh, you know, get in near uh, uh, resistance and try and sell ahead of that. We can try and buy ahead of support. All right. A lot of times, if we uh, miss the initial move that occurs, um, it depends, you know, wh where we're going to get in. So it's the kind of thing where, you know, we know the average true range on most of these pairs is anywhere from, you know, 100 to 150 pips. If you get that kind of movement already by the time your trading session begins, all right, then the odds may be in your favor that, you know, there could be a potential pullback or reversal. All right, does it mean it's going to happen? No, of course not. But you just have to kind of be aware of that and see. I mean, you don't want to be the guy who, uh, you know, is last to the party and, and sells the low of the day or buys the high of the day thinking that you're going to catch a breakout or a breakdown. All right, when I think about breakouts and breakdowns, typically I like to try and hit those out of uh, range bound support or resistance. Okay, so if, if we break to the upside and that resistance doesn't hold, I want to try and buy that. If support is broken to the downside, I don't want to try and sell that. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see, genius. Oh, this is for genius. Okay, right now, short 13 for 8 pips, 15 pips. 
All right, you guys can continue to uh, talk amongst yourselves. That's fine. No, I'm just kidding. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go back to the five-minute charts and see what's happening here. You can see that uh, euro is just pushing up on this 20-period moving average, and uh, perhaps there is a uh, scalp in there. Uh, let's see. Ed, um, are you talking about me, Genius? Do you want to see the one-minute chart on euro? Uh, here's the one-minute uh, scalping chart that I use with the uh, three standard uh, deviation Bollinger Band setup. I don't know if that's what Genius is referring to, but basically we use this for a little bit of scalping, and you can see that, uh, you know, with the intense movement that we've had here, that it's really sort of just flattened itself out, and I don't see a lot of action. You can see how tight these bands are right here. So uh, we'll come back to that in a bit, but you can see you're moving higher. All right, we've got, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, pound taking out uh, 163.75. Um, I may be waiting for maybe just a little bit of a pullback to see if we could retest the lows, and then I'd think about potentially getting into um, a, a long trade here. So I'm just going to be a little bit patient with it. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, you get on the webinar and you, you want to place these trades, so, you know, you start banging in a little bit early. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens here. I mean, it looks like price is moving back in our direction. But it's, uh, it's, it's still not uh, a done deal yet because we had a, a pretty big movement down. Let me see. I have what's called a reverse psych bounce. Do I ever trade such? Uh, I'm not certain what you're talking about, genius, with the uh, reverse psych bounce. But, um, you know, there is um, some times when, uh, you know, you want to go in and, and just look at these different levels and see, okay, what's happening there? What are, what are people thinking? I mean, you know, it's, it's when you look at, uh, what's going on with Euro here, all right, that, that 145 level screams out at you. You know, we talk about the law of round numbers in the market, how it's just, you know, too convenient for people just to say, oh, 145, you know, or oh, 144. These are just round numbers that people tend to gravitate, flock around for no other reason than it's sort of a, a psychological barrier. Um, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily have any technical meaning, although sometimes it can, depending upon uh, you know, what price action has done and, uh, you know, where people have been trading. But generally speaking, uh, I'm looking for swing highs and swing lows. Okay, you can see earlier this morning on Euro, all right, the 146.50 looked to be about pretty good uh, resistance up there. We actually tested it on this initial uh, Trichet talk. I remember looking at the charts going, wow, that's a, that's a lot of movement right there. I didn't know exactly what he was saying, but uh, I knew as soon as he came up there was going to be some volatility. So let's see here. Uh, genius. Uh, for example, you get a big directional move, the average euro bounce between 20, 40 pips from bottom before retracing. Right now you bounce about 78 to about 20, 40, and then retrace 50% more of that range. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of like that, genius. Um, I don't have, uh, like a rule that's as, as, I don't, well, I guess it's not that firm, but, you know, when you think about what's happening, it's, it's really just about, um, you know, the velocity of price, where it's going, and, uh, you know, once they get to these levels, what happens? What occurs? So you can see we're just putting in a little bit of minor resistance here above this 20-period uh, moving average. We're still sitting up at 150. Okay, there's going to potentially be a nice short here. Um, maybe if we get the breakdown of 145, okay, we could potentially push lower. Okay, let's uh, look at pounds, see what's happening with pound. Pound, again, tested this 20-period moving average. And you can see it's just pulling back just a little bit there. So... Uh, we're going to keep an eye on this and uh, uh, see what's happening. But, all right. Well, Genius has one-minute charts that would blow my mind. <laughs> I'd love to see him sometime, Genius. In fact, perhaps uh, we should get you on one of these webinars. Uh, you know, uh, that would be uh, that would be pretty neat. You know, a lot of people uh, like to contribute and show what they do. Um, I think uh, you know any information is good information, especially if uh, it's things that people can derive, things that can help their own trading. So. Sure, I'd love to see you, genius. Absolutely, anytime. Um, all right, well, we're just taking a look around. I just want to see if there's anything else that appears to be happening. What I want to take a peek at is, uh, let's look at the Aussie dollar right here. Let's just see what's happening with Aussie. All right, looks like we had, wow, that was a nice sell-off earlier on that unemployment report. I don't know who was awake uh, earlier in the morning for that one. You can see we're just popping up against uh, a little bit of minor resistance here, just above uh, uh, 106 here on Oz. So this is uh, this is interesting. Um, potentially, uh, you know, there may be a trade in here. Um, we're just going to flip it over onto my. Uh, let's go to this one and see. Aussie. 
Okay, so we've got Ozzy with uh, uh, pulling back just a little bit here, and you can see how this resistance was set up just based on the swing high from earlier in the morning. Okay, this could be a decent range-bound trade, about 25 pips, perhaps more if it goes lower. Let me see. Would Bollinger Bands work with 30 and 60 minutes more accurately? Um, you know, that depends, Michelle. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting, but a lot of times when you get um, specific uh, candle types that occur with the bands, they can work. Um, typically speaking, though, you, you don't see as many setups as you would um, on, say, a five-minute chart. But let's just say, for example, okay, we're on the 60-minute here, and we're looking at Aussie. Let's go back to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me pull it back up to the euro. I just want to keep, uh, uh, where am I? Euro, euro, euro. Let's do a one-hour chart on the euro. All right, you can see that right here, okay, we've got these uh, candles that have closed outside of the band, or at least this one's setting up to start looking like it's closing outside of the band. <clears throat> you can see the stochastics approaching oversold at this area. So do I think that there's potential for a reversal in here? Yeah, absolutely. But I want to see, uh, you know, a nice candle set up, um, you know, from the perspective of, uh, you know, I really want to be confident in uh, in what it's showing me. So, you know, you could probably hop the gun right here and, and think about affecting a long. But at this point, I think the uh, the trend here clearly looks down. All right, so we're just sitting right at this 145 level. All right, and what I'd like to see now is I'd like to see a little bit of a push lower here. Okay, you can see we've got a stochastic cross that happened just above that over uh, overbought area. If we can get a push lower here, all right, then it could be doing one of two things. It could either uh, be setting up for the next leg lower, all right, or it may give us a good buying opportunity a little bit lower. We can potentially get in just ahead of this uh, 144.75 area. Uh, that was the previous swing low. Uh, but, uh, are Bollinger's easier to use more profitably than straight channels? Um, you know, that depends. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, your trading style and what you like to do. Um, channels are great for uh, people who are more trend traders. Uh, trends can be anywhere we know from uh, short-term trends to intermediate-term trends to long-term trends. So, uh, you know, if you're within uh, trading a channel on, say, a longer-term chart like a daily and you're in a long-term trend, then those can be quite significant. You know, the, the bands are going to give you um, a lot more um, action that occurs based on the movement that happens uh, with the uh, uh, an individual pair based on the velocity of that movement. So in other words, you get a couple of big candles that go either way. You're going to see those bands start to expand and move, whereas the channel is going to be primarily based on just the trend and where price is. And it, it doesn't matter if it took five minutes to get there or if it took three hours to get there. Okay, so you know you have to think about the the velocity of these trades and and you know how fast it takes something to get there. I mean, you know you, sometimes you can get into a nice uh, say uptrend or downtrend where it's just kind of pittering along slowly but surely, you know, moving ahead. Uh, you know, the idea of the tortoise and the hare. Um, other times, boom, something may happen to cause price to get right there, uh, right out of the gate, and then potentially it stays there. So with uh, with channels. You know, it's really more uh, based on, on just strict price and trend, whereas the bands also incorporate a little bit of the velocity of the movement. Because from a trading perspective, um, I tend to like that a little bit better. All right, so we can see we've just had a little bit of an issue here at this 20-period uh, moving average, which is the middle band. Um, but I'm not seeing much to the downside here. So it looks like uh, 145 is uh, holding up uh, for the time being. I just want to switch back to pound here, see if we've gotten any movement lower. All right, so pound pulling back a little bit, but not a ton of conviction to the downside, although we're starting to move a little bit. All right, so we can just sit there and say, well, you know, this looks a little bit like a, uh, a bear flag, and perhaps we're going to get an equal movement, okay, to the downside that we got from top down. So you figure if we started this at about, oh, let's just say 164.25, we got down to uh, 163, uh, whatever it is, 60. Yeah, I figure that's 25, 65 pips. Perhaps there's 65 pips to the downside, which would put us at, surprise, 163 even. Okay, so sometimes it's kind of funny how that works out. We can go back to, you know, say something like a daily chart. And, uh, you know, we can take a look and see, all right, well, where does it look like we've got some support? 
All right, we can look at that 163 area and see that, boom, that takes us right down to the bottom of the band. So I think that, um, you know, with a little bit of a clear downtrend happening, well, I wouldn't say clear, but on the shorter term charts, let's look at it uh, maybe in the two hour, you can see that we're in a little bit of a range bound situation and it looks like the lows here at 163 could be tested. All right, so I'm back to the five and as you can see, we haven't really uh, taken any trades. We haven't really missed any trades, um, you know, unless uh, we want to do some major scalping. Uh, at these levels, I don't think uh, scalping is warranted because perhaps there is a greater move happening, whether it's a continuation of trend here or maybe a reverse. So we're just keeping our eye on it to see what's happening. But you can see that we've, we've sort of hit these uh, tighter, narrow ranges, and, uh, um, you know, we're kind of in between right now. Question uh, Donkey and Channel or Bollinger Bands? Are you asking my opinion of which, Rob? Um, it's the kind of thing where, you know, I use the Bollingers, uh, but I have used Donkey and for different uh, types of uh, trading activity. For example, um, I use it sometimes uh, in scalping. Okay, I actually like to scalp uh, violations of the uh, Donkey and Channel, whether it's to the upside or downside. But, you know, for my, for my money, I, I prefer the Bollinger Bands just because not only is it going to give me an idea of, you know, where the ranges are setting up, maybe what the direction is, all right, but it's going to tell me how fast is something's happening. And again, we talk about that velocity, all right? What causes those bands to expand so quickly? Well, typically it's it's big candles that cause that to happen. And why do we have big candles? Because there's typically a big movement one way or the other. So that really shows you that shift in, in uh, you know, what's going on. If it's just, you know, things are kind of middling, you've got small candles, not a ton of conviction, all of a sudden, big candles mean a big move one way or the other. And, you know, because we know that we uh, can't really get great uh, volume readings here in the Forex market, it's not a centralized exchange, that, you know, the candles are really one way that we can look at it, and that can tell us if there is big volume. All right? Sometimes uh, candles will move because there's a lot of volume, and it just happens to be uh, uh, either selling or buying pressure on one side is that much greater. All right? Or big candles could mean that uh, volume is actually less. Okay, and there's just not a lot of uh, uh, conviction on the other side of the way the candle is moving. Okay, and it doesn't take much to move that candle down. But either way, all right, we think about the velocity of that. So that's that's why I tend to like the bands a little bit better. Oh, genius! The market should be paying you daily. We don't pay for uh, for instruction here. This is a, a free and open society, and that's that's why we do this out of the goodness of our hearts. All right, there's never an ulterior motive, okay? No one's ever trying to sell you a service or tell you how great they are. All right, it's all about just trying to help one another. So we'd love to see your webinar, Genius. I'll be the first guy to sign up. All right, in the meantime, you can see that we're just, yeah, just testing this little tight range here, okay? But what's going on is as we're setting up these little candles here, okay, you can see that things are starting to flatten out a little bit. You got the bottom band pulling up. You got the top band coming down. Perhaps we are going to set up for a little bit more of a tighter range, which then could potentially give us um, some breakout potential. So um, just watching here, uh, looks like Euro is just starting to breach this 145 area, okay? And you can see here, it's just been just constrained by this middle band, which is the, just a, uh, a 20 period SMA. So um, you can see right now we're uh, statistics have crossed over. We're now heading down. All right, let's see how low we can go here. Perhaps, uh, you know, we may not make a new low, which could provide um, a bounce opportunity for us. So we're just keeping an eye on both of these. Um, has anybody got anything else that they're looking at? I mean, where's where's the action in the market today? Are we just uh, completely missing stuff here? seems to me that, uh, you know, all the action started to happen already, and now, uh, you know, we're kind of dried up. Um, what about uh what about euro versus pound? Is anyone looking at that one? Let's get rid of this. Wow, look at that move there. Euro pound. Huh. You can see on this chart I've got a uh just a uh uh an EMA crossover system that I'm I'm kinda watching. I'm I haven't really uh decided if I like this or not. But basically the idea is I've got a uh five, a thirteen and a sixty two EMA up there. All right, those are Fibonacci numbers, and I'm just trying to see that uh, short-term uh, trading volatility when uh, the lower one crosses the middle one, crosses the lower one, you know, boom, hopefully there's a reversal there, and you can affect a quick scalp. It looks like it may have worked pretty nicely in the sell-off here uh, earlier this morning, 
Okay, as the as the uh, five came through the thirteen, as it came uh, right through the sixty-two, all converging at the same level, which is sort of uh, uh, you know we would say jackpot. But uh, you know that was kind of a momentum trade. I typically use this for scalping about twenty pips, and looks like that may have worked today. But just one of these things I'm just kind of playing around with and keeping an eye on. So uh, nothing real exciting happening there. All right, so what's these questions? Is there a way to avoid the big wick so that one can protect himself from getting stopped out? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, it's, it's hard to say. The only thing you can really do um, is, you know, talk about stop placement. Uh, you have to give yourself um, an opportunity to, uh, you know, be able to sit in a trade. So, for example, if you know support is at, let's just say, 163.50, for example, on the pound, all right, you may need to uh, put in uh, a greater distance, okay, for in order for your stop to, to not get not get hit. Okay, because what happens is that everybody in the market knows where these areas of support and resistance are. All right, it either gets there or it doesn't. But once you start getting to those to those levels, all right, there's there's an added pressure to go ahead and try and hit those stops. It, it happens. All right, so what can you do? Well, you can either take on more risk by moving your stop lower. Okay, you can use uh, what we call a mental stop or an emergency stop, which don't typically like to recommend, but sometimes when you get in these situations, um, it happens. Or the, the, the other thing to do is that you just have to be ready to get back in the trade. And, you know, you see that a lot. But, you know, for example, you might buy at, say, 163.75, put your stop at, say, 163.48 because you know that 50 is the support level, but you just want to be just below support and, you know, two pips is probably too close. But say price comes down, you get a wick, it stops you out, and you think, oh, that was a bad trade. But all of a sudden you get that big wick and, and it's moving higher. Well, guess what? You can get back in that trade. You know, buy it back at 163.60. All right, you just picked up uh, uh, price improvement, 18 pips better than where you were initially in, or 15 pips better. All right, and see if it holds. All right, so those are the ways that you want to look at it. Um, but there's really no way to avoid the long wick because, you know, well, listen, a lot of this is program trading. A lot of it is, uh, uh, you know, market makers and things like that. But once you start getting these support levels, I mean, these people are trying to play breakdowns, all right, and they're trying to play breakouts. So you're going to see that initial move higher, and it's like, uh, you know, you think about that game when you were a kid. I don't know if anybody ever played the old Red Rover game, you know, where you're standing there, you're holding arms, and, and the kid comes running from the other side, and he tries to break through the line. And you know what? Sometimes you're going to hold, and, and sometimes you're not. You're going to get through. You know, so it, it's, it's that kind of thing where, you know, it, it's not like there's just this brick wall that sits there at, at support or resistance and says, all right, that's it. You know, there's going to be times when those areas get breached. So you have to be aware of that and either be willing to put on the extra risk, okay, or be willing to get back in the trade. Those are, those are basically your two options. All righty, so we've got Euro moving slowly back here. We're uh, just under that 145 level. Um, just not loving anything here. All right, here comes pound now. That's uh, a little bit better. All right, we'll see uh, how low we're going to go here. Maybe we get a little push back to this 163.50 area. Now, what's interesting is it looks like the band is just starting to point further down. All right, this could uh, uh, mean that we're going to get some more selling happening here. What uh, What's up with euro pound? Nothing. All right, so I'm just watching it to see what's happening here. And you know, sometimes uh, uh, patience is a virtue. You know, that's uh, one of the things that we talk about in trading is that you have to sometimes let the trades come to you. You know, you can't just go out and try and impose your will on the market. All right, people who do that um, aren't going to last very long. Okay, but again, if you take these some of these low-risk opportunities, all right, try and get things to, uh, uh, you know, your edge aligned in your favor. All right, it's okay if you take a trade where, you know, you, you get stopped out for 15 pips, okay? Because you're giving yourself opportunities. But you really want to wait and see what's happening. I mean, you know, trying to uh, pick off reversals here after these huge candles, all right, that's, that's uh, you know, that's, that's a fool's folly. And you can see what happened right here is that actually people tried to do that. You know, you can see that this candle closed outside of the band. Here we had a doji. There goes a hammer. And everyone's thinking, okay, there it is. There's the reversal. Some nice long wicks. Okay, it comes in. Looks like uh, a little bit of a, well, I, don't, I wouldn't want to call it a spinning top, but you can see that candle. And then all of a sudden, boom, the selling continues and uh, pressure and velocity picks up because everybody tried to get long on that candle on the reverse has to abandon ship. So, you know, you can sort of see what goes on with the market action. But 
if you look at it right now, it looks like, okay, we're setting up here just ahead of uh, 144.90, and I think we're uh, getting a little bit of oil inventory numbers out. Let's see what's happening with oil. Bear with me one moment. All right, so it looks like we're getting a little bit of a build-up. That's uh, not gas. Yeah, unfortunately, my new server can't coexist with the uh, webinar software. It's too much of a resource hog, so uh, I don't have the benefit of getting uh, uh, the live numbers as they hit the tape. And I'm uh, just like any other schmo watching the uh, watching the old TV here, trying to get a hold of these numbers. But um, it's been interesting what's been going on with OPEC recently. Did anybody take a look at that yesterday? <laughs> Worst OPEC meeting ever. All right, I've got this. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about comic book guy from The Simpsons. I don't know if anyone's familiar with him, but <laughs> this is OPEC meeting was the worst meeting ever. Um, and it's interesting to see what's going on with these uh, with these uh, OPEC nations. I mean, listen, $100 oil. Um, you know, I don't know what's to complain about. Um, you know, you talk about what the levels are, where they uh, like them to be, but you know, I can tell you by and large, these guys are all uh, producing as much as they can at any point in time. All right, and and they're trying to get as much out the door as possible at uh, you know these higher prices. So what the actual levels are don't mean so much, but you know it just goes to show you that the ideas of supply and demand in the oil market aren't as important as people think. You know, and and listen, I'm one of the first guys who'll tell you I think it's a weak dollar that drives oil markets. I think it's U.S. interest rates, and everybody will tell you no, it's speculators, it's it's uh, supply and demand, it's global growth, it's seasonality. All this other stuff, you know. I would just love for you know one of these guys to say once, you know, hey Bernanke, you know, what 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 would oil price be if we were at two percent, uh, you know, normalized interest rate, you know, a little bit closer to our historical average. All right, if he said anything but, you know, twenty to thirty bucks lower, he'd be a liar. So my opinion, it's it's all about the dollar, and that's what sort of drives markets. You know, it's it's unfortunate but true. You know, blame speculators if you want. But speculators need to find a way to make money, all right? You're not going to put your money in a bank account that pays no interest, okay? You've, 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 you've exhausted stocks. I mean, stocks have been flying, you know? You've got uh, uh, oil as a commodity. And let's face it, you know, if you have something that people want, if demand goes up, prices are going to move. So, you know, that's what's going on with oil. So uh, let's see here. Okay, there's the little pop on pound. Where's the uh, euro? Yeah, we're getting a little pop on Euro. You know what? Maybe I'm going to take a uh, quick little scalp here. Let's just buy, uh, I don't know, let's buy two Euro. Okay, two little ones. All right. Now, what am I going to do here with this? Uh, let me put my stop down here just below. I'm going to go in at about 73. So, let's see here. Uh, place a stop. And it's about... Oh, 25 pips. Uh, let's go a little bit lower. There we go, 73.50. All right, so what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and uh, get myself lined up here. Got 25 pip stop. I'm looking for about a 50 pip move. So I'm hoping to come back up to around 145.50. But you know what? I'm not going to go ahead and place a limit at this juncture um, because you know what? What happens if we get a strong move? starts moving higher, maybe I don't want to get out of 50, all right? If, if, if the candles start moving, if price starts going in my favor, maybe I want to try and take a little bit more. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, it's 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 just one of these things where I'm, I'm just playing the odds, you know? And price has already come down uh, to the point where, you know, listen, can it go further? Absolutely. You know, can this be a day where we are outside of the normal ATR of euro? Absolutely. All right, but over time, you know, I, I feel like uh, I do better when, uh, you know, these things retrace a little bit. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're, you're not just going to get that, that selling down, uh, that move in one direction uh, as you hope. So, you know, it looks like markets are feeling okay today. We've got Janet Yellen talking later from the, uh, the Fed. She's a notorious dove. So, uh, you know, she might have something dumb to say, which could help juice the markets. So who knows? But you know what? 25 pips of risk. I'm comfy with that. And we'll let it ride. So let's see what else here. All righty. Uh, questions about Iran, Venezuela, and Algeria. 
you know, it's it's so hard to keep a handle on all these different regions around the globe. Um, at the end of the day, that's why it's so uh, I feel disingenuous to the you know talk about oil from just the supply demand perspective. You know, I mean, I can remember back not even that long ago, say maybe five or six years ago, how you know you could sit out there and you could play this oil inventory number, uh, trading stocks and ETFs. All right, USO was one. And it just always seemed uh, a little bit odd to me that, uh, you know, whatever the U.S. inventory was, all of a sudden that's what dominated the market, as if there was nobody else in the globe that consumed oil, you know. And, and okay, so maybe we get a little transparency here where they give you these numbers, but, you know, what are the numbers coming out of China? You think they're buying oil? You know, the, I mean, it, it, it's just sort of silly when you think about it from a supply-demand perspective, okay. All right, so our, our supply increases or our demand increases, Okay, so what? What if, uh, you know, China just has insatiable demand, doesn't stop buying? All right? So a lot of different things that can go into that market. Uh, let's see. What do I think about the idea that gold is now the fifth major currency and can should be traded that way? Oh, well, Mr. Volker, interesting, uh, interesting question. You know, it, it's funny, but I feel like gold kind of comes in and out, and it, it has uh, different properties. You know, some days, uh, you know, when things aren't looking so swell, Okay, it really becomes that uh, that fifth currency you're talking about. More importantly, that safe haven currency. You know, so it's like uh, uh, the Swiss franc, uh, you know, Japanese yen. Even though you know things in Japan don't look so hot, and they're talking about potential uh, B of J uh, or G7 intervention. You know, who knows when and if that's going to occur? I think that's a lot more talk than than anything. But um, you know, sometimes that's that's the properties that gold takes on. Other times, you know, when things are good, people kind of take it in, in the uh, uh, risk-taking uh, uh, mode, you know, when there's risk appetite as, a, as an appreciable asset, All right? So it's got dual properties going on, and I, I think that it's, it's, it's really hard for me to find a scenario under which I don't want to own gold, all right? If, if, if the stuff hits the fan and we have structural issues and, you know, debt defaults and all this other stuff, will we probably see gold sell off? Yeah, perhaps initially, but you know what? I think I still want to own it. All right, but if we get something like, uh, uh, you know, boom, there's a lot of risk taking, all of a sudden everyone's got their act together and things look pretty good, then that may be a time that, uh, you know, gold may uh, pull back a little bit. But at the end of the day, um, you know, gold has become that, that additional safe haven uh, currency, as, as you mentioned. So, you know, I, I kind of look at the gold and, uh, and the Swiss franc right now as, uh, you know, sort of trading uh, together. So there's my one minute. All right. Next OPEC meeting is till November, December. Means oil prices will remain high until then. Well, okay, yeah, that's a good question because you know we have to consider what's really driving oil prices. You know, and and I'm I'm making the case that it's not supply and demand. Okay, that all right. So perhaps it is global instability, but I'm telling you, the major driver of oil prices is a weak U.S. dollar. Well, what happens if uh, you know QE2 is actually allowed to end? All right, and they say, you know what, enough is enough here in the U.S. Let's, let's get our act together. Uh, no more monetary easing, all right? We have to take care of the fiscal side, and let's let the cards fall where they may. Well, guess what? They turn off the spigot of free money. Okay, that could mean some major selling out of stocks, major selling out of commodities. Hey, we could see oil move dramatically lower, all right, regardless of any changes in supply or demand. All right, I can tell you that, uh, you know, right now with OPEC, with the way these things have been going, those guys are selling uh, 24-7 day. You know, it doesn't matter where price is 100, 105, 100, you know, boom, just get it out the door now while we can. You know, if prices go higher, we'll just sell more. You know, if prices go lower, then we need to sell even more. So I think that there can be a case made for lower oil prices as well. Let's see, uh, OPEC hates the inflation the U.S. is causing with the monetary houses as they get back U.S. with uh, reducing oil supply. Yeah, it's, uh, it's true. Um, it's true. Listen, everybody hates U.S. inflation that they cause around the globe, you know. You can look at the uh, the core CPI data here in the U.S. and agree with uh, Bernanke. There's no inflation in the U.S., you know. It didn't just cost me $70 to fill up my tank in New York City the other day at 4.75 a gallon, <laughs> you know. But there's no inflation. <laughs> it's not out there. Look at the core numbers, I'm telling you. All right, we're going to take food and energy, strip it out. All right, but go anywhere else around the globe, and guess what? They're seeing inflation. So, no, nobody likes U.S. inflation. Uh, let's see. 
So as you said before, Stealth QE2 is coming. Uh, well, that very well could be. I mean, the continuation of QE2 or the extension uh, by not reducing uh, the Fed balance sheet and just continuing to roll these things over, that essentially is the extension of QE2, which some are going to term QE3. You know, if, if there's, I think there's a, a, a thought in the market that, well, the only way it becomes QE3 is if they do actually more on top of, not just continue. But, um, you know, listen, I think we're going to be in easy monetary conditions for some time. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate because, again, it, 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 it buys politicians time to do nothing. You know, and I think you see the converse of that happening at the ECB, okay, where, uh, you know, they're getting out in front of the inflation and saying, listen, you know what, we got a lot of problems here, but you got to fix them because we're not going to allow inflation to go crazy here. So, you know, not only are the citizens, you know, getting hammered with austerity in these different countries, but now everything costs more. No, not going to happen, you know. Figure it out, get it, get it done. But in the U.S., you know, these guys are all getting ready to go on their summer vacations. You know, let the uh, Obama golf watch start. How many times is he going to be on the greens? You know, he's setting himself up for the senior tour. <laughs> but, you know, these guys want to get the heck out of Dodge faster than they can, and they're not going to get anything done. All right, maybe we'll raise the debt ceiling. I mean, most people don't realize this, but you realize there's no budget for the U.S. for this year already? All right, so it's like, it's kind of like, you know, sitting down with your wife mid-year and saying, hey, we really need to come out with a budget for the entire year, and realizing that you already spent all your money. You know, you're supposed to set up a budget before you start the year so that you know what you're going to do moving forward. We don't even have a budget yet. All right, they're waiting to see how much the uh, debt limit gets raised to see how much they can spend. So just bad policy in the U.S. causes weak dollars, causes inflation around the globe. All right, let's see here. Uh, Bernanke said he will reinvest the principal. Yes, he did say that, um, which, you know, again, it, it's we're going to have to see how exactly it's done, you know, and what they're rolling over. I mean, let's face it. How much of this stuff is, you know, and i got to tell you, I'm not a, a, a QE2 expert, but or, you know, I don't really look at the Fed stuff. I just sort of pay attention. But how much of this Fed stuff is, is uh, you know, these mortgage bonds and this, this garbage toxic assets on, uh, on worthless mortgages? How are they going to roll that over? You know, who's going to buy that? How are they going to get out of that one? You know, you got a lot of stuff that's just black hole money that's gone. So unless they increase it, okay, that balance sheet should be decreasing. All right, unless they find some stupid buyer for it. Who knows? You know, unfortunately for them, everybody else around the globe is caught up. You know? It's not like, uh, you know, the old Goldman Sachs days. Let's go rip their face off. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. So, uh, let's see. Bad U.S. policy will go down in history. I agree. I agree 100%. Uh, let's see. Is the U.S. Uh, business of <laughs> Pakistan or Greece? Beautiful. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens this summer. You know, the... Uh, there's always the, the sell and may go away crew who looks like, you know, they may be on to something, but I think there's going to be way too much volatility and fun to be had this summer to, you know, just pack it up and, and, uh, and shut it down. Um, there's always, you know, something exciting happening somewhere. And, uh, you know, in this global day and age of, uh, you know, Twitter this, Facebook that, you know, we're on top of everything. And, and uh, you know, somebody uh, uh, sneezes over here, and, and the next thing you know, markets are going nuts over there. So, a lot, lot of interesting times, and uh, I think it's, uh, you know, you do a disservice to yourself if uh, you just took the summer off. So, uh, anyway, guys, uh, that's uh, pretty much what I've got here. I've got to wrap it up. Um, again, I'm Mike Conlon from uh, FXEDU. We offer uh, online affordable trading courses for Forex Market. All right. Uh, also do a uh, Forex mentor program. We're actually uh, mentor students one-on-one. -on -one. So if you have any questions about that, um, come check us out. All right, our website is www.fxedu.com. I'll pop it in here for you if you want to take a look. And uh, that's really uh, what I've got for today. So uh, we're going to see how this Euro trade plays out. I'm going to let it ride for a little bit, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. So uh, all righty, gang, thanks again, FX Street. Uh, good trading to all, and uh, we'll see you uh, see you next time. So long.